to speak generally about Bahrain would not be to add something that's very new. The human rights situation in Bahrain is what it has been for the past approximately four years now. Uh, we're still seeing arrests almost on a daily basis. We're still seeing protests. We're still seeing an attack on free expression, on freedom of assembly, and so on and so forth. And so the human rights situation continues to deteriorate inside the country. Um, the topic that I wanted to focus on today uh, specifically is the attack, uh, the systematic attack on human rights defenders in the country. What we've been seeing for the past four years as well is how human rights defenders who have been at the forefront of uh, the fight or the struggle for uh, human rights and democracy in Bahrain have been systematically targeted with the Bahraini regime using the judiciary as a tool to go after them. Um, of course, my father was one of the f first people who were arrested in 2011. He's someone who's very well known for his human rights work, not just in Bahrain, but uh, throughout the region and also internationally. He was severely tortured and then sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, he continues to serve that sentence today. Um, when I went back to Bahrain, just to speak very quickly on that, I knew that there was a risk that I would be arrested. <coughs> But I decided to go back anyway because my father was on a hunger strike and I was told that we could lose him any day. And I hadn't seen him for almost two years, so I decided to go to Bahrain and attempt to see my father in prison. I was stopped at the airport where I was falsely told that my citizenship has, had been revoked and that I was no longer welcome in the country. And they wanted me to turn around and get back on the plane. I refused to do so, stating that I knew my rights and I knew Bahraini law and that there was no way that my citizenship had actually been revoked. Long story short, I was held in a room inside the airport for more than 10 hours at freezing temperature. Uh, just to uh, give you an example of how cold it was in that room, I was wearing a jumper having come from Denmark where the weather was already getting quite cold. And I was wearing a coat on top of that jumper and I was still freezing. And I informed them several times that the temperature was abnormally cold in the room. Uh, nothing was done about that. I asked to go to the bathroom at several points. I asked to pray. And if every time I would be told that they had to wait for orders, sometimes they would make me wait up for up to two hours before I was allowed to go to the bathroom or pray. Um, part of the, my stay in the airport, I was assaulted by four policewomen, one of them a lieutenant from the criminal investigations department who I then found out was actually related to me. Um, due to the assault that, I, that happened uh, in the airport, I suffered from a torn muscle, uh, muscle, uh, shoulder muscle, uh, which I'm still getting treatment for. It was to my surprise that six or seven hours later, after the assault, I found out that the policewoman who had assaulted me had filed uh, charges against me of assault. Um, the medical evidence being a scratch on the finger of one of the policewomen. And because of this, I was then uh, taken to the criminal investigations department where I was told that I was facing several cases, uh, one of them being insulting the king online, which faces up to seven years imprisonment. Another one was related to uh, the Wanted for Justice campaign, which we had run in November 2013, which named some of the um, most serious, uh, mo the people who had the most serious implications in human rights violations in Bahrain. Um, after that, they only moved forward with the assault case. I was taken to the public prosecution where I was not allowed access to a lawyer and then transferred to the Isa Town Women Facility or Women Prison where I was held um, approximately 20 days. The case against me is still ongoing, uh, as is the case with so many other human rights defenders in Bahrain. My next court hearing will be on the 5th of November. And if I do not attend that court hearing, um, I sh according to Bahraini law, I will be sentenced. They moved my case, which was also unprecedented. They moved my case from lower court to higher court. So I went from a situation where I could have received two months imprisonment sentence to uh, having the possibility of re receiving minimum three years in prison, uh, maximum seven years. One of the things that I've already mentioned that we've been seeing in Bahrain is the use of the judiciary system to try and silence people. And of course, this always comes associated with people's practice of their right to free expression. Nabir Rajab was arrested um, approximately a week after my release. I was actually supposed to visit him that night and then found out that he had been arrested for tweeting um, something that is actually very true. He said that the people who are joining ISIS today, the kind of ideology that they follow, is something that has become 
uh, a part or uh, comes from places like Bahrain, where these governments have become a sort of incubator for these kind of extremist ideologies that we're now witnessing across the region and have become a very um, extreme threat to everyone, uh, not just the populations in Syria and Iraq. He was, of course, arrested because of this, and he was, he's going to be tried on the charge of insulting the military. Yesterday, my sister Zainab had uh, two hearings in court. Uh, one of them was for uh, insulting the king by ripping or rather destroying public, um, what's it called? Property. Public property, which was a picture of the king. And she had two hearings, and then one, she was supposed to have another hearing today. I'm just pulling it up right now. Sorry, one second. What Zainab decided to do was she decided to make a statement. In places like Bahrain and the Gulf in general, to decide to stand in a court that belongs to the ruling family uh, and to make a statement where they think that what they're doing to you by taking you to court is silencing you and then making the exact, doing the exact opposite of what they're trying uh, to enforce on you uh, takes a lot of courage. Uh, as soon as she, my sister walked into the courtroom, she stood in front of the judge and said, I would like to speak. And then she said to him, I'm the daughter of a proud and free man. My mother brought me into this world free, and I will give birth to a free baby boy, even if it is inside your prisons. It is my right and my responsibility as a free person to protest against oppression and oppressors. And then she did the very act that she's, she was being charged with and standing trial for that day. She ripped a picture of the king, placed it in front of the judge, and sat down. Um, just that step in itself, sending this kind of message to the Bahraini government that you can take us to court, you can imprison us, but you will not silence us. We will continue to practice our right to free expression. We will continue to defy these laws that are unjust, these draconian laws that have been put in place by the ruling family in Bahrain. Takes not only a lot of courage, but especially with, uh, for Zain someone in Zainab state who's eight months pregnant at the moment. For her to take that kind of stance, I think, says a lot about the kind of situation we're in inside in Bahrain. She's currently at the public prosecution right now and facing at least two to one to two weeks imprisonment just for doing that alone. And that's not even counting the other cases that she's facing at the moment. Other people that we've seen arrested who are human rights defenders are Naji Fatil. Naji Fatir was arrested in 2013, severely tortured, which he actually showed in court. He took his shirt off in court to show the judge that he had been tortured, uh, and then sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. Again, Naji Fatir was uh, targeted because of his human rights work. He's one of the most prominent human rights defenders in Bahrain. Mohammed Al Masqatli, another prominent human rights defender in Bahrain, is currently facing charges for illegal protest in Bahrain. Of course, the, the uh, law in Bahrain says that anything more than five people in, gathered in one place is an illegal gathering if you do not have the permission of the Ministry of Interior. What I think is very worrisome, not just in Bahrain, but in general, is this crackdown on all these different rights that people are supposed to be guaranteed universally. Um, and the fact that there isn't the right kind of rea reaction from their, the allies of those countries. For example, and I think this is one of the most serious cases we're facing right now, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr, who's a very prominent cleric, and who was one of the only clerics to publicly support both the Bahraini and the Syrian revolution, has today been sentenced to death. The reason he was sentenced to death was because he spoke truth to power. And this is part of the problem. When you have a situation where people are not allowed, uh, not allowed to practice their right to free expression, they're not allowed to practice their right to human rights work, they're not allowed to practice all of these different rights, you create a situation where people cannot move, where people cannot do the work that they want to do. And thus, um, that's how you create a situation where people turn to violence. And I think that that's one of the biggest threats that we face in the region. Why is it that we're seeing so much violence increase in different countries um, around the, the Middle East and North Africa today. It's because people have no space to do nonviolent activism. And the people who preach nonviolent activism as the only methodology are quickly silenced by the regimes. And I think that this is very, very, um, very, very important to bring up in the discussions that happen between the West and the Gulf states and other countries in the Middle East and North Africa. When we're talking about the threat of ISIS in the region, it's very important to ask, where does this ideology come from? The people who are joining ISIS today in Syria and Iraq, where are they coming from? 
In Bahrain, the government has relied on extremist thought uh, within their most sensitive institutions in the country, like the military and police, because they thought that this was the way that they could keep the opposition at bay. And so the people, there are so many different kinds of people within the military and police institutions who are sympathizers with ISIS ideologies. If you don't think uh, that's a threat, then I don't know what is. Um, we're looking at a situation right now where we've already had four people create a video promoting ISIS who have, quote unquote, defected from the Bahraini military to join ISIS uh, in Syria and Iraq uh, because they believe that this was the right thing to do. Um, and they called on others inside Bahrain to do the same. These are people who are being trained by Western allies because of the security agreements. I think that it's, at the very least it's laughable that we're seeing an alliance where Gulf states are taking part in the fight against ISIS while they are creating the platform for extremist thought and ideology within their own countries. And not just that, it's being created within the most sensitive institutions where they, they are being trained and armed and then they leave those institutions to go and fight with ISIS. If we are to fight the ISIS threat in the region, we need to see where it's coming from and we need to fight it at its very core. One of the ways to do that is something that was already mentioned in the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, which was there is a very uh, severe need to desectarianize the military and police in Bahrain. When the Bahraini government relies on one group of extremist um, thought in the police and military, it becomes so much more difficult to fight that kind of ideology when it starts to become a threat, not just in Bahrain, but in the region. One of the ways to fight that is to make sure that all factors, all sections of the society are allowed to serve in the military and police. That's one thing that we, has been brought up several times in the past years. But unfortunately, there's, there hasn't been any real pressure from Bahrain's closest allies, like the United Kingdom and the United States, to force them to implement these recommendations that were made to the government so many years ago. I think that it's, we're at a point right now where there are so many different threats that we're facing in the region where nonviolence activism is only becoming so much more difficult to do. Um, and in this time, I think it's the most important where we stand by those who um, strictly abide by the values and the principles of nonviolent activism, most of whom are in prison right now, not just in Bahrain, but also in Saudi Arabia and other places, like Walid Abul Khair, for example, in Saudi Arabia. It's a very important name of someone who should not be sitting in a prison cell. Um, but I think where the responsibility lies is not just within the Bahraini system, but also by, with the allies that support the Bahraini government. The reason that I was released from prison, right before my release, the Bahraini government was escalating um, in my case. Like I mentioned, they, they turned my case from lower court to higher court and so on. I did not think that I was going to be released. It was because of the pressure that was created internationally um, on the UK and US government to take a stance on my case that actually guaranteed my release. And so I think that, that that very same kind of pressure can be created to get these governments to respect human rights. We already have some of these um, regulations in place. There are very specific EU guidelines on the protection of human rights defenders, for example. Why is the UK not abiding by those when it comes to their allies? These are questions that need to be asked here in the UK. They need to be asked in places like the US where they're supposed to they, s they continuously talk about how human rights and democracy are the cornerstone of their foreign policy. At the end of the day, when you ask whether certain governments respect human rights and democracy, it's not going to be um, whether they enforce these uh, principles on the governments that they don't agree with. What's going to be asked is did they hold up their allies to the standards of these principles? Today, the, the answer would be no. The answer would be that the Bahraini government and other Gulf states have been able to get away with most of the human rights violations that they commit. And it is the responsibility of these governments who are basically enabling governments like the Bahraini government and the Saudi government in committing human rights violations. It is their responsibility to change their attitude towards these governments and to take a better stance on the situation. The UK and the US have the capability. They have the leverage. They can use the alliance that has now been created with the Gulf against ISIS um, to make sure that these, go these governments respect human rights. And I think it's about time that we see that kind of action taken. At the, I mean, to conclude, um, there's a, several recommendations that I wanted to make that I think the US and the UK government can do um, in the current time. 
we're, we're hope or we're working towards a resolution at the next Human Rights Council session. It is of the utmost importance that the UK not only uh, not stand in the way of that resolution, but actually supports it, as well as the United States. Another thing would be allowing access to, human, to special rapporteurs from the United Nations into the country so that they can go and see the situation, monitor it, and make their own assessments of where we stand right now when it comes to human rights inside Bahrain. Um, putting pressure on Bahrain to implement the recommendations of the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, as well as the Universal Periodic Review recommendations that were made, most of which have not been implemented within the country. The reform of the judiciary system. Uh, during my last meeting with the FCO here in London, they told me that they believe that the Bahraini government was reforming when it comes to the judiciary. I have first-hand experience that says that they are not. Um, even the examples that were used by the FCO as evidence that the Bahraini government was reforming when it came to the judiciary, like the special investigations unit inside Bahrain, I now have first-hand experience that proves that they, that they are not independent and that they're not doing the job that they're supposed to do in attempting to bring accountability to the police and officials that commit human rights violations. And so I think that these are topics that need to be brought up. These are questions that need to be put at the very forefront of the discussion with governments like the US and the UK. And I think it's about time that we hold Gulf governments and other governments accountable to the human rights violations that they commit. Thank, Thank you. you.